you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, a panel of experts who will be talking today about regulation, whether platforms uh, should regulate themselves or whether there should be co-regulation or some form of enforced regulation. regulation. Uh, to my right is Mr. Thomas Schneider, uh, Head of International Affairs at the Office of Federal Communications in Switzerland. And to his right is Latifa Akarbach, President of the African Communication Regulation Authority Network and President of the High Authority for Audiovisual Communication in Morocco. Then we have Alison Gilwalt, Executive Director of the think tank ICT Africa, based in South Africa. And Bertrand de la Chapelle, Executive Director at the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network in France. And lastly, Emma Bates of Diem. It's a new social platform, primarily for women and non-binary. So we have about five minutes for each speaker to address uh, some of the key questions around uh, regulation. Um, and I'd like to start by asking Thomas whether we can essentially trust existing platforms to self-regulate or even comply with what we're discussing today, given that their business model is primarily about profit. And as we have seen with some platforms, some have turned a blind eye to disinformation or hate speech and even profit from it. Yes, thank you, Ian. Actually, I would like to, to uh, go one step back when we talk about regulation, which is, uh, in our view, and as somebody that is, is a civil servant, whenever we talk about regulation, we should always keep in mind what the goal of the regulation is, because every regulation is, is an intrusion in, in freedoms of, of actors. So what is the goal, what is the purpose, and what is the problem that we're trying to solve? And also we should ask ourselves, what about the existing norms? Because some things may be new, but not everything that we witness now when we've heard this this morning is completely new. It's maybe quantitatively new, maybe that turns into qualitatively new. What about existing norms? How much of the problems can we solve with just applying the existing norms to, to new developments? maybe apply them on a principles basis. So what is, is the gap then just to be precise in, in the application of the norms in a specific new context? So what is the gap that we need to fill or we are trying to fill with new regulation? We also need to think about what are non-intended consequences of well-meant regulation that we may face when we don't really think the regulation through thoroughly. And, and uh, so, what is, what is uh, if we, uh, th the goal is to basically or inter alia fight the spread of illegal and harmful content. I think illegal content is something that we are fairly used to also defining what this is. It is more difficult when you talk about harmful content because the question is harmful to whom? And um, if you um, take the word terrorist, the fight against terrorism, we have witnessed increasingly that um, Politicians, presidents use the word terrorist for everybody that does, does not share their opinion or criticizes them. So how should we force platforms to fight terrorists? Um, what does that mean? So who defines this? Um, so, and the problem is, is actually broader because if, we, if these words like, like terrorists or war or good and bad lose their meaning because they're used by anybody against anybody, then we face a problem which is much broader than actually the regulation of platforms because, and we've heard this this morning as well, we face a destruction of all our values and rules of our institutions and that may lead to fights to wars where the strongest ones wins and everybody else loses or if no one wins we all lose it and this is something that I think we should keep in mind as the bigger picture when talking about something like regulating platforms. We need rules for platforms, but we also need better rules for politicians, for presidents, for judges, for parliamentarians, for journalists, for citizens, so that we all keep our institutions functioning and keep our values and, and societies uh, alive and, and functioning. So with regard to platform regulation, I think in order to have the desired effect, we need to be aware that there are different types of platforms that may require in detail different regulation to, to same, uh, have the same 
purpose because they may have different roles and responsibilities. So a video sharing platform is maybe not the, doesn't have the same role like a messenger uh, service. There are platforms that are mainly geared at private communication, others at public. Difficult is everything that is in between and how quickly now you can switch from private to public communication. So again, not just what are we trying to regulate, what are we trying to achieve, but actually who are we regulating? Is, is an important question where we need to look more closely. In this regard, I would just like to allude to the Council of Europe's recommendation on a new notion of media from 2011, also 12 years ago, that gives a logic that I think is quite compelling in how to identify the functions and the, the relevance of media, whatever services, uh, for democracy, rule of law, and, and, uh, and human rights. And I think what, no matter how you do it, whether it's a uh, a self-regulatory model or a co-regulatory model or a, a government model, it needs to set the right incentives for actors to behave. I think this is fundamental. In my country, Switzerland, we have no law for the press. We never had. We just had one line in the, in the Constitution that said press freedom is guaranteed and the rest was and is self-regulation. And it seems to work until now. That may not work for platforms like it has not worked for television. So we have a different regulation for broadcasting, for instance. So you need to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, develop a system that is, allows you to implement the same principles on individual cases that you may not even know yet that they exist because they are in the future. So this is the key challenge, I guess, for, for all regulation. And to sum up and come back, I think the most important thing is that we all understand, and I guess the presentations this morning were very clear on this, whatever platform regulation we develop, if we do not, as individuals, as a society, stand together and fight for our values, fight for the rules-based societies that we've been able to create in the past uh, 100 years, 200, 300 years. If we do not fight together to keep them, to develop them, and fight against those that try to undermine and destroy them, then a platform regulation law is probably not the biggest problem we'll have. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll move over to you, Latifa. Um, Maria Retza spoke today of a tipping point in 2024, which really struck me because it really underlines the urgency of this. Um, what do you believe the next steps should be and how can we convert the conversations today and this week into actual laws? As, as Thomas just described, this is pretty daunting. This, this is a, a huge challenge. How can this be enforced? Merci. Euh, alors, tout d'abord, j'aimerais euh, euh, commencer par euh, rendre hommage à l'UNESCO euh, d'avoir pris ce leadership pour euh, euh, enclencher euh, ce débat dans le bon format. Euh, en tant que euh, régulatrice dans un pays africain, je considère que euh, ce qui est en train de se passer dans nos vies euh, quotidiennes demande une réflexion à l'échelle du globe et, de, et demande euh, une démarche vraiment inclusive où tout le monde doit pouvoir analyser euh, et faire prévaloir ses perspectives. Donc il est très important, euh, par exemple, euh, que l'Afrique euh, puisse aussi euh, expliquer euh, sa perspective et euh, je considère que euh, cette ouverture vers tout le monde est un, est un prérequis euh, logique et, et, et cartésien. C'est pour ça que euh, ce matin, quelqu'un a dit euh, « Oui, les, les, les GAFA, nous sommes nulle part sur le continent africain, c'est vrai. Euh, » nous, Parfois, on a des représentants qui nous gèrent à partir de Dubaï, euh, c'est des cultures différentes, cette diversité est absolument importante à être prise en charge. C'est pour ça que la Haute Autorité de la euh, Communication Visuelle du Maroc, euh, dans le cadre de son mandat à la tête du réseau des instances africaines de régulation des médias, nous allons organiser le 27 avril prochain, euh, pour la toute première fois, une conférence internationale qui réunit les régulateurs africains euh, d'un côté et des représentants des plateformes numériques globales de l'autre pour que l'on s'écoute mutuellement mais surtout pour que l'on puisse parler comme vous dites d'avenir mais il faut évaluer le, le présent personnellement euh, je ne je pense que les plateformes numériques ne sont ni vertueuses ni vicieuses elles sont lucratives et cet élément doit absolument être pris en charge intellectuellement, ne pas être oublié quand on veut travailler sur un nouveau modèle de régulation. Euh, pourquoi Parce que euh, 
là où nous cherchons à protéger les sociétés par une régulation euh, éthique et une régulation indépendante, les plateformes euh, nous écoutent parfois parce qu'elles elles ont senti au cours des dernières années qu'il y a une pression des opinions publiques, euh, mais leur modèle économique est vraiment à d'autres soucis, Alors, je, à d'autres principes, je voulais dire. Donc, ce n'est pas leur souci, ce n'est pas leur, leur agenda. Maintenant, il est très grave de ne rien faire rapidement. Il y a une accélération de l'histoire au niveau technologique. On ressent l'oppression de cette accélération technologique. Attention, je ne suis ni technophobe ni technosceptique, mais nous, il y a une véritable demande sociale pour la régulation maintenant sur le continent africain parce qu'il y a des dangers euh, en termes de circulation de, euh, de discours nuisibles, de discours de polarisation ethnique, de discours radicalistes, euh, d'atteinte à la dignité des femmes dont a parlé madame donc cette demande sociale nous devons y répondre et il faut faire y répondre rapidement de manière efficace parce qu'il ne faut surtout pas normaliser avec ce qui se passe alors qu'est ce qui se passe nous sommes dans un monde globalisé où euh, les, euh, les, 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 les les plateformes régulent nos émotions individuelles et collectives euh, un espace commun auquel nous appartenons tous où euh, les plateformes euh, régulent la parole publique. C'est un pouvoir exorbitant que les plateformes numériques qui sont des intérêts privés, des sociétés privées, qui ont commencé comme des start-up, qu qu c'est un pouvoir exorbitant qu'elles assurent le gatekeeping de la sphère euh, euh, publique numérique. Nous ne pouvons pas laisser faire ça. Il y a atteinte au fonctionnement démocratique de nos sociétés, il y a atteinte aux droits de l'homme. Je peux vous dire, par exemple, que l'enfermement euh, algorithmique tel que nous l'observons vu de notre continent, est très grave parce qu'il il participe justement à, à, à donner une chambre d'écho à la dimension du monde, à des narratifs toxiques. Donc euh, il ne faut pas considérer cela comme normal. Je pense qu'il n'y a pas de, de fatalisme technologique et que c'est l'homme qui a inventé la technologie, ce n'est pas le contraire. Donc il faut aller dans ce dialogue pour essayer euh, de trouver une, une, la meilleure manière de responsabilité, de responsabiliser les plateformes euh, sans aucune atteinte à la liberté euh, d'expression. Nous, régulateurs, euh, nous sommes considérés comme légitimes parce que notre mandat, c'est de veiller à la réalisation de l'intérêt général dans l'espace public médiatique sans toucher aux intérêts privés. On n'est pas contre les plateformes, on est pour euh, le droit du citoyen d'accéder à une information euh, qui est intègre, à, une, à, à être protégée contre la mésinformation et aussi euh, la malinformation et euh, l'instrumentalisation de l'information. Donc, je pense que euh, la, le, régulateur, le régulateur ont une valeur ajoutée extrêmement importante, mais ce n'est pas à eux seuls de régler ce problème. Donc il faut une multirégulation qui existe déjà, mais il faut que les, les coopérations existent parce que euh, cette situation n'appelle pas qu'une réponse des marchés. Il faut une régulation du marché. Elle appelle des réponses éducatives, des réponses au niveau de la régulation. Donc je pense que si l'information intègre de qualité est un bien public, la régulation indépendante et éthique est aussi un bien public. Merci. Um, Alison, um, I'd like to get back to the topic of the urgency here um, and ask you your opinion. You're involved in, in the regulatory discussions um, about what people have been calling guardrails. Uh, and in particular, I'd like to ask Who will be setting them? How, how will that process work, or how should that process work, in your opinion? How will they be applied? And in terms of human rights, which some of the panelists are talking about, um, has there been any risk mapping done on that in terms of, uh, are we making the right decisions, or are we actually curtailing some degree of freedom of speech? A lot, lot of questions in there, but... Thanks very much, Ian. Um, so, um, Ian, I mean, just to start, you know, I, I think the, the whole point of the guidelines is trying to find ways in which we can balance, you know, the, the positive potential, you know, uh, for freedom of expression and, you know, opening up 
uh, access to information that is really unprecedented that has happened through these um, big di digital platforms. But also understanding that alongside that goes the system systemic um, production of harmful content. And I think we've had, you know, the, the data this morning, the evidence of, you know, virality way exceeding when it's a negative content as opposed to positive content, etc. So, you know, the first thing I, th I would say about these guidelines is that it's important to delimit what we can do, um, but we also we need to understand that in dealing with content regulation in the way that's being proposed through self-regulation is not dealing structurally with the causes of, of this harmful content, and that that would require us examining these business models. These, you know, the, the, the ability to cause these harms on scale is a result of the scale and scope of these, you know, the network effects that these companies have um, to, tied together with their advertising models and their attention models and their behavioral, um, you know, recommendation algorithms, et cetera, that produce these negative outcomes. So there is a sense in which we are, you know, um, plastering over this giant wound in the content regulation, but acknowledging that the kind of structural market changes that you'd need in order to address these problems, the you know, advertising standards would need to be applied and those kinds of things would take some time to do. Um, you know, I think there are things that, um, from a, 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 a global guidance on this, a global governance on this would be helpful um, because most of us, you know, smaller countries, um, less, you know, developed democracies or less, mature, you know, established democracies, less mature markets. Um, certainly countries without the institutional endowments to do this kind of complex regulation. Um, and, and, and even if they've got, you know, laws in place, which of course should minimally apply to all platforms, um, big or large, um, is that they, the, the real challenge with this problem is enforcement is that you know, we might all have these you know, human rights frameworks in place, but we should also not assume that. Um, so that is a problem with, with implementing this, is that we, you know, we're assuming that there are these, this normative consensus, which I'm afraid there's not, um, that these human rights um, that we're wanting online exist offline, and they often you know, are not, even where people are signed up to them. So I think these, you know, these are enormous um, challenges that are, would be supported by an international framework that deals as far as possible with dealing systemically or getting these big platforms to deal systemically with the problems that, you know, that they are creating um, to deal with these negative multipliers that, that, that they're responsible for and taking the costs because we simply don't have the resources for them. So how we do that then is also quite critical because I think um, you know, the concept, sorry, that is meant to be my half time. <laughs> um, sorry. So, um, just to say, that, you know, I think the, using these concepts of self-regulation, solar regulation are quite important in understanding what we're trying to achieve. Because I think while for many people there's an acceptance that, you know, the, the platforms have been unregulated, that as um, the director was saying earlier, that the self-regulation hasn't worked at all, that, um, you know, it's establishing sort of state control of these bodies is also equally problematic, um, you know, especially where we have you know, a predatory, accountable, and oppressive states. So if we look at these, these models we've got now, you know, we've got the solo regulation model, which is effectively the meta kind of its own oversight board. Um, and I think although the people have seen some successes on doing this, as I said, you, it's almost impossible to deal with the scale of the problem. Um, almost no match how much they put into it, but they could put a lot more into getting that right. Um, but essentially, it's, it, it's a body regulating, it's, it's a company regulating itself, and there are inherent problems with that. So it would be better to have a self-regulation in terms of the way we've understood it historically by an industry. Um, and these historically have only worked where there is some sort of um, regulatory or governance enabling framework. Um, and it might just be at the constitutional level, but most require some other requirements that the industry is meeting the policy objectives of that purpose. And so I think just, sorry, the, and the final one is that the co-regulation is problematic when it allows the state in any way to control the content. And I think right. that's the kind of concern with the things you've seen um, with the, in, in India, for example, where there's, you know, there's now the proposal that there's an 
judicial appeal on content that ca is open to, 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 to political mo uh, mobilization. Okay. And just to say, finally, the last problem is, is that our multi-stakeholder model, which is kind of the best of the bad things that we've got, is highly flawed as it's currently practiced. It's, it's not, it doesn't really enable equitable participation by different parties in different contexts. And so an enabling context for that is also required so that people have the resources to participate effectively. Small countries in these discussions, civil society in you know, global forums, etc. Thank you very much. If I had a producer in my ear, they'd be saying, speed it up, you've got three and a half minutes left. So I'll reduce these two uh, conversations, uh, but then I'll come back in the other direction in the second round. Uh, Bertrand, I'm very interested in the French perspective here, and I'm going to ask you an edgier question. If Elon Musk was here on the panel, listening to all this, what would you say to him? What would you expect him to say back? And yeah, you didn't see this one coming, but uh, I didn't. <laughs> but, but also, if a platform like Twitter refuses to comply with whatever regulation comes forward in coming years, what would happen in France? What would happen in Europe? Could there be a ban? Well, I think if he were there, he would answer what I will answer now, which I will not take the bait. Meaning that uh, it's an interesting question, but I'm neither a French representative anymore. Um, that was more than 10 years ago. Uh, and don't speak for France in particular, and I don't know what Elon Musk should do because it's a larger problem. And one of the challenges, I mean, to pick on what you're asking, is we keep moving from one shiny object to another shiny object. So today it can be uh, Elon Musk. It was the Christchurch uh, call. It was the terrorism when we had Daesh. It was all of these problems are extremely important but we need a systemic solution. And the reason why we need a systemic solution because we are going through a civilizational transition. The Prime Minister of Iceland said something that is very important that resonates very much with me. We are actually in one of those communications revolutions that change the way the fabric of society is organized. We had language, writing, printing. We now have the internet. Each of those stages has dramatically changed the way we organize society. Empires, royalties, and the Westphalian Treaty that came out of the printing press. I believe that we need to have something that deals with the dynamics of this uh, technology. And one of the reasons or the problems we're confronted with is that we're all feeling or afraid that we're losing control of the trajectory of our societies. And because we do this, everybody is using the existing tools that are vastly insufficient. You cannot regulate the couple global platforms using only the national legislations. We need something that is, I don't know what, but that needs to be a bit transnational. We need things that are not purely intergovernmental. We need multi-stakeholder something. So I want to look a little bit forward and interject a few um, very quick remarks because it's, it, it's running. One, when we think about independent regulators at the national level, and by the way, the guidelines are an extremely good basis for discussion, don't get me wrong. But when we talk about independent regulators, the more we think about it, the more there will be many independent regulators in each country that will have to deal with those issues. And there's a very interesting philosophical and constitutional question, which is how do you organize the coordination between independent regulators? at the national level, and I've been a French representative, and I can tell you that the coordination internal, and Thomas knows that, and everybody knows that. So organizing the coordination between those actors at the national level is a, an interesting question moving forward. And globally, we need a mesh of new types of coordination mechanisms. The other thing is, quickly, we need to look at regulation like software. We do not function and we should not function with regulation set in stone like the 1881 regulation on um, freedom of the press and, and so on in France that hasn't been untouched. We need things that are adapted with version 2, version 3, and the implementation is key. In this regard, the Digital Services Act in Europe is a masterpiece of legislation that raises very interesting refinement implementation problems regarding the geographic scope of content restrictions, 
um, meaningful transparency or risk assessment, for instance. We need tools to associate the actors in the implementation. I want to add that there's a distinction that we don't make enough between three words that are very different in English and that are actually the same in French. It's responsibility, accountability, and liability. And the discussion about the Section 230 is mingling those things in a way that I'm afraid is going to lead to very bad unintended consequences, and we need to think about them. And finally, there is a lot of concern about the behavior of the companies, and it's legitimate, and they have really a lot to be accounted for. But I would like to highlight that the two events that were mentioned this morning, January 6 in the US and January 8, I think, in Brazil, the people who were behind those things were, as far as I understand, the actual presidents of those countries. And we need to share the responsibility, and Thomas was, was saying it. It's not only about bashing the companies legitimately, but we need to understand that given the responsibility to the governments to regulate this, needs an oversight as well. And in the international system, as Taufik was mentioning earlier, we do not have anything that helps really make the governments accountable. Final point, I was mentioning the Treaty of Westphalia, which came after the 30 years war. And what I just said is basically the old Roman question of quis custodiet ipsos custodes, who guards the guardians? Who makes the guardians accountable? And in this case, we need to stop this war that has been going on for 10 years with wins and losses on both sides. One time the governments win, one time the, part, the companies win. We really need to get seriously around the table and find the rules of the distribution of responsibilities between the actors. And regarding the question of the responsibilities of private actors doing a sort of public function, I would like to remind all of us that the right to be forgotten, which is a good thing for Europeans in general, is a situation where the highest court in Europe has entrusted a private company that is not even European with the task of balancing protection of privacy and access to information. In both extremes, it's excessive. If they are tasked to do it entirely, it's absolutely not accountable. And if every single decision on this had to be made by a court in the national system, it would be unbearable in terms of burden. So we need to find the ways to distribute those things. And there's a wonderful word in German, or in the German environment, they have tested the concept of regulated self-regulation, <laughs> which is almost a joke and an oxymoron, but it's a framework for self-regulation. And I think that's what we're talking about here. Thank you. Emma. You must be really relieved, having created a, a network that's new, that doesn't have a lot of these problems. You're trying to create a safe space for people, you know, women, non-binary people, others who have struggled on these platforms to find a space to express themselves. Super interesting. You must be relieved. But tell us a little about how you have gone about moderation on your platform and, and how you feel about this sort of wider uh, perspective. We'll have to be a little quick. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I think that for us, something that we're super aware of is just like distributed moderation and the power of distributed moderation. I think that um, just to, I don't know if this adds a touch of positivity to the conversation, but um, every sort of early stage or, or mid stage consumer social founder I know is deeply aware of their responsibility from a moderation perspective, from a um, data bias perspective. Uh, that I think we can't afford to be naive anymore. Uh, we've seen what happened over the last 15 years. And so uh, I personally am optimistic that at least the next wave of social uh, platforms that do disseminate and could have the potential to disseminate misinformation uh, will hopefully be going about it in a far more responsible and sort of uh, co-regulated manner. Um, I think that going back to the point around distributed moderation, uh, the way that we do it is we sort of 
in every facet of the platform are looking to align user interest with business interest, which is where a lot of, uh, I think, the problems have come in this last wave. Um, and the way that we view that from a distributed moderation perspective is actually incentivizing the community to participate in the collective experience of everyone. Um, we, you get rewarded points, we make it fun, we make it um, a place where you really feel like you have a part in building this platform and if you're a doctor and you're seeing this information then like you have a just as much a responsibility as, as a sort of platform who sets the values to um, to participate and to, to really influence what exists in there. Thank you very much. So now we'll move on to another section which will be about 15 minutes and it's uh, involving audience participation uh, with the stakeholder groups. And I would like to start with the private sector. It's very difficult to hear, uh, to see from the stage, but could you please stand up and raise your hand if you would like to make an observation? Right down the middle. Hi, my name is Farzan Badi. I'm the head of outreach and engagement at Digital Trust and Safety Partnership. And I just, uh, Alison uh, mentioned self-regulatory um, and self-governance initiatives, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, trust, digital trust and safety partnership, which has over uh, 10 members of uh, large and smaller uh, tech companies, and they have, uh, they adhere to a set of best practices that involve enforcement um, policy, uh, and also improvement to those policies. And uh, the second stage of their accountability stages, there is a self-assessment stage that the companies have assessed themselves and their performance and uh, the maturity level of these best practices. And um, now we are at the stage that uh, we have issued a call for the assess like third party assessors that could um, assess these companies uh, independently. And these are the, and also I wanted to mention that um, in our conversations, I have not heard the term trust and safety uh, at all uh, uh, during this day. And I think it's a field that if we want to do content and conduct governance, uh, we need to uh, pay attention to and uh, also help with. Uh, developing it further. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go to the intergovernmental organizations. Any observation or question to the panel? I think someone needs to stand up or speak. It's very difficult to see. Okay, we will jump to uh, the public sector. Straight down the middle, thank you. Merci beaucoup. Je me présente Hussein Al-Badou, président Raïs Sultan Al-Ulia Les Sahafa et Samiyat Al-Basariya de Mauritania, président de la Haute Autorité de la Presse et de l'Autovisuel en Mauritanie. Je vous remercie de l'UNESCO à la Mounakash Tal Al-Mado. Je vous remercie de la Mounakash Tal Al-Mado. عندما يقول بأن الحرب من الأهمية والخطورة بحيث يجب أن لا تترك فقط للعسكريين المعلومة ملك المشاع وملك العموم وما دام الأمر كذلك إن شركائها متعددون ليس فقط ناقلها أو منتجها وإنما كذلك مستهلكها ولذلك كل هؤلاء الشركاء يجب أن يكونوا شركاء في تقييمها وفي تأمين سيابيتها ولكن أيضا في تقييم والاطلاع بضبط محتواها لذلك بات من المهم بالنسبة لنا جميعا كمنظمات ضبطية أن نعرف بأن هذه الكيانات الجديدة المتمثلة في المنصات الرقمية بقدر ما شكلت حسنة عصرنا بما فرضت من دمقرضة للمعلومة ومن تحقيق للتدفق الإعلامي المنساب فإنها باتت تشكل خطرا لغاياتها الجوهرية التي من أجلها وجدت الدمقراطة تحولت إلى مركزة في يد مجموعات قليلة سلطة الدولة وسلطة الهيئات الضبطية المكلفة باحترام الحرية وضمانها وترقيتها باتت موضع شك بفعل وجودها في يد خواص 
تمنع الوسائل الفنية والمحاباة في كثير من الحالات من دفعهم إلى تحمل المسؤولية اللازمة موقفكم الآن في اليونسكو وقبله في مراكش وقبل ذلك في نيامة كنا نناقش بأنه من الضروري إيجاد حل وتحقيق هذا التوفيق القلق بين ما يعرف بالحرية وبين ما يعرف بحماية الحرية من جنوح الحرية أيضا لذلك آمل أن يتوج هذا الملتقى بالمزيد من ابتداع آليات كفيلة بتحميل كل الشركاء في انسيابية المعلومة مسؤولياتهم التامة سواء غربلة لها حرصا على السلم الاجتماعي حرصا على محاربة الأخبار الزائفة أو الدفع أو التحريض على الكراهية وأعتقد بأن هذه عتبة مهمة آمل أن تتبع بعتبات أكثر إلزامية سواء بالتنسيق مع الهيئة الأممية أو باستعادة التصالح مع المتطلبات القانونية بأن الدولة وأن السلطات الضبط هي المكلفة بحماية الحرية حينما تجنح وبترقية الحرية أيضا وأن هذه المنصات مستفيد الأول من كل حسنات النضال التي قيم بها من أجل توسيع الحريات ويجب أن تتملك وأن تعي خطورة الأدات التي وضعت تحت صرفها ولذلك أختم بأنه بات الإشكال إشكال عالمي لحد الآن نحن عندما نأتي إلى فرنسا يعتقد البعض بأن المنصات غربية الغرب يقول لا هذه منصات في وادي السيليكون وادي السيليكون حتى السلطات فيه تتم مصادرة آراها أيضا والرئيس الأمريكي السابق لم على ذلك هي خواص باتوا يمارسون الخدمة العمومية ولذلك يتطلب أن يعوا أو أهمية وخطورة المسؤولية التي يطلع بها وأن يشاركهم الآخرون بما فيهم الدولة وسلطات الضبط لا وجود لتنسيق لحد الآن بين سلطات الضبط وهنا أتحدث مع الرئيس خرباش وهذه المنصات ومن الضروري وجود خصوصا وأنها سلطات مستقلة وإن كانوا مفرط الحساسية هي تدخل الدولة فهذه سلطات مستقلة يمكن أن تطلع بكل تنسيق خدمة لترقية الإعلام والإنسيابية المعلومة جوري ميرسي Thank you very much. I was just about to jump in to thank you, but also say conscious of time. Um, we will now jump to um, academia or uh, technical community. Do we have an observation from that sector in the room? Over here. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Fatih Shravasev. I'm a professor of political science from Purdue University in the US. So, so far, people have expressed that the tech companies have too much power already, but the co-regulation model proposed in the guidelines uses the power of the UN to empower tech companies to assume even more power, uh, this time as, um, as co-regulators. But I'm curious, though, um, how do we think about the basis of platform authority to act as global governors alongside states? Not just platform power, but authority which relies on securing consent from the governed. So who are the governed? How is that consent achieved? By whom? And can that consent be revoked? Thank you. Thank you very much. And lastly, civil society and media. Redshed. I believe you mean me. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> I am from the London Story, a civil society organization documenting hate speech. We have repeatedly flagged content to different platforms that violates local laws in different countries, such as India. But the platforms repeatedly state that this does not violate our standards, even though it violates local laws. At this point, Platforms are deciding what is hate and what is not hate. Therefore, I absolutely agree that we cannot further empower companies to decide more of when they want to step in and when they don't. And the guidelines as they stand propose that companies may, if they find relevant, act and put in place systems. This is not sufficient. So I concur with the question, where does this authority to decide what is truth, what is not truth, what is hate and what is not hate come from? And how is it okay that companies sidestep and overcome existing laws? Thank you. Thank you, that's an excellent question. And, and I'd like everyone on the panel to keep that one in mind after we go to um, the online discussion uh, to get their input. I'd love to address that because certainly as a journalist working for a large news organization, uh, we also face that problem when, when there is hatred aimed at our journalists, our fact-checkers, 
who do you go to? Who, how, do you, how do you get that taken down? Uh, and sometimes it's the minimal re requirement um, needed, posting a photograph on your account, to be actually complying with the law according to these platforms. So I think that's a great question, thank you. Very briefly, we'll go over here and then we're gonna go on to the, uh, the, the Zoom call, please. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Precious Ibiri from Do Nigeria, a civil society representative. So um, I have been having a conversation and uh, I believe we can discuss about multi-stakeholder approach without establishing the roles other stakeholders like the back-end developers play in combating this maintenance. Now, what is the focus on empowering these um, back-end stakeholders like the developers on how to bridge the bias when it comes to building these technologies that powers um, or, or that combats fake news in a sense? And of course, my question also takes into those solutions in the, the global north as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I believe at this point we will get uh, some insights, some reaction from uh, the online community who are listening in around the world, and I believe a colleague will be providing that information. Yes, thank you very much, Ian. So, um, thank you very much for your participation in the session. We have received contributions through the online digital platform and the links we've been sharing during the meeting. We also want to thank you for your engagement, which is critical to this consultative process. We've tried to identify some comments and questions that have not yet been explored during this discussion, which we'll now read to you. We received one comment from the Global Network Initiative, which reads, version 2.0 of the guidance includes self-governing bodies, which is welcome, but also vague. While co-regulation is useful, maybe even necessary, what are the key criteria that regulators should use to determine what self-governing bodies should be delegated co-regulation responsibilities? Another comment comes from an electoral commission, which says, regulation needs to require public disclosure of information by social media and AI companies, respective policies that promote internet for trust principles, all tools that are used to implement these policies, process used to assess related risk, basis for audit of performance in respect of this implementation. This audit information should be publicly available. And finally, an individual submission which reads, the guidelines should do more to support public involvement and thereby the legitimacy of the overall system. See, for example, the Council of Europe principles on media and communication governance. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let's just go back to the panel again and address the question, the penultimate question in particular, uh, in terms of, again, how, how will this work? Who, who will ultimately have that final say? Who will news organizations or concerned citizens go to in your vision? Um, I'll leave it to any of you to raise your hand to answer that question, please. Ce qui est sûr, c'est que la responsabilité sera forcément partagée. Euh, parce qu'il ne faut, euh, faut pas oublier que cette explosion, cette révolution de la technologie numérique euh, a créé de toutes pièces un nouvel espace public et que nous, voulions, nous ne voulions ou non, nous appartenons tous dans nos diversités culturelles, dans nos croyances à cet espace. Donc il faut vraiment euh, réfléchir à comment euh, euh, est-ce que cette nouvelle euh, conditions numériques de l'humanité euh, apportent plus de liberté, plus de droits de l'homme, plus de démocratie. C'est cette question qui, à laquelle nous sommes tous, en tant que communauté internationale, obligés de répondre. Donc, c'est forcément pas les euh, plateformes numériques euh, ou le capitalisme numérique qui apportera la réponse à cette question. Alors, euh, pour réagir à une, à une euh, question de tout à l'heure sur la modération, l'autorégulation et la modération exercée par les plateformes. Euh, nous, régulateurs africains euh, des contenus, on est vraiment très déçus par la manière dont cette modération est faite, elle est imparfaite. J'aimerais bien savoir quel est le pourcentage du chiffre d'affaires des plateformes qu'ils consacrent à la modération. 
on ne le sait pas, euh, les, euh, ces process, les algorithmes ne sont pas transparents, ils ne sont pas lisibles, et en même temps, euh, il y a eu une adaptation des plateformes au discours de la régulation, ils ont euh, vu qu'il y avait une pression citoyenne, donc je pense qu'il n'y a pas d'autorégulation, il n'y a que des preuves d'autorégulation, et il faut que ça soit évalué par des organismes euh, indépendants. Il y va, encore une fois, de la cohésion de pas uniquement national dans chaque pays, mais de la communauté euh, internationale. Et je, fais, je termine en disant euh, notre travail euh, collectif pour la mise en place d'un nouveau modèle de régulation, une régulation éthique, une régulation indépendante, est très important. On est au début de l'histoire de la, de la régulation, mais il est euh, très important qu'on le fasse avec tout le monde, qu'il y ait une inclusivité générationnelle, qu'on on, qu on ne pense pas uniquement à la génération Z, mais aussi aux personnes âgées qui sont aussi euh, exposées à des risques, qu'on le fasse avec une inclusion sociale, parce qu'il y a une fracture numérique encore dans le monde d'aujourd'hui, qu'on le fasse avec une inclusion géographique, comme je disais tout à l'heure, l'Afrique n'est pas euh, autour de la table de, la, de cette négociation internationale, pas encore, and as we, everybody knows, if you are not at the table, you are on the menu. <laughs> Emma, I'll give you a bit more time now. So what are your concerns? I mean, we, we haven't really determined what a moderation panel would look like, even if there would be one global one, but do you have concerns about the makeup of that potential moderating body? Who would be on it? How, what decisions they might take, what perspectives they have, what demographic they are? Could you talk on that topic? Yeah, for sure. And to, I think my opinion stems or sort of builds on top of exactly what you just said. And um, I think if you move through the world being objectified or having been harassed in real life situations, you sit at the table with a very different set of priorities. Um, and that's not to say that you have to have been harassed to be able to determine moderation. It's just so, so important that in those, uh, whether they're panels, whether they're internal audits, external audits, that people who are present are an incredibly diverse set of individuals um, that are listened to, not just sat there for tokenism, um, but actually their opinions and their experiences are valid. I think a lot about um, this doesn't just extend to moderation, but also like the features that exist within platforms, like something that you and I talked about yesterday, which is I often think of direct messaging as like digital catcalling. And if we're allowing for these like interactions, of, and that's content, sending someone a message as a piece of content, if we're allowing for that to happen in, in the way that it currently exists, um, there's a lot that can go wrong. Um, so yeah, I'm the, the people around the table, I know it's a very cliche thing to say, is so, so important um, in how we approach all of this. To, to the rest of the panel, I think that's a really fascinating point that the way social media has been built is perhaps the problem, that um, so much of it is performative, you know, look at me, look how wonderful I am, or in the other direction, just this invasive ability to send a direct message to someone who is vulnerable, and that's the first thing you see in the morning or when you go to bed, and that creates a lot of mental anguish. Do you think, looking forward, that there will be enough uh, conscience, consciousness about this, that platforms can change the way they are actually built so that it's, it's more about sharing in a constructive way and, and less, um, less damaging to individuals? Is there a fundamental flaw in social media? Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd, I'd like to make two points. One, on, in, this, in this regard, I was making the distinction earlier between uh, responsibility, accountability, and liability. Accountability is also evaluated in the measure to which you learn from your mistakes and you correct them. This is experimental, and what is happening with the um, generative AI is a perfect example. Somebody I was talking to the other day was making the comparison with drug development and clinical trials. What Microsoft and some of those platforms are doing by testing it with some actors is the equivalent of a clinical trial. And it's true that the social media platforms have developed without that sort of thing because nobody imagined at the beginning that it would take that amplitude. What is at fault, definitely, 
is the speed of reaction in the feedback loop regarding what is happening, what are the lessons, what we can improve. And it is true that for sometimes, when you have algorithms that organize the recommendation, changing one parameter in this metric is actually changing the dynamics of the things towards polarization, towards engagement, or towards consensus. So I think it's going in this direction, probably not fast enough, and that's the, one of the topics that should be discussed. I would be remiss not to mention one thing very quickly that I didn't uh, mention previously, and that I hear nobody talking about. We are discussing and we are witnessing today the first hearing of the Supreme Court of the US regarding the chain, two cases regarding Section 230. There is no framework at all that will take into account the extraterritorial impact of a decision in one country over the platforms that are dominated there. And that is a missing piece of institutional framework. And it's not the fault of the US, it's not the fault of others, it's the international fabric based exclusively on territorial national sovereignty. It is still relevant as long as the actions of a national government in this place, like other topics, is limited to the territory of the country. The moment it has an extraterritorial impact, there is a need to find a way to associate actors. I sometimes joke by saying, if you want to launch a satellite, you don't use Newtonian physics. You use relativity. We need to apply a concept of relativity to the authority and the sovereignty of governments when there is an extraterritorial impact. Not that it is bad that there is an extraterritorial impact. It's needed but it needs to be within guidelines as well, and interactions. Very interesting, thank you. Um, Alison, I'd just like to get your thoughts on, is there a flip side to this? If uh, laws are somehow codified and there's progress made on that, could there be a counterproductive element? Could some states with author authoritarian governments use that to actually attack journalists, to attack freedom of speech by twisting the meaning? Uh, defamation? Are, are there concerns? And do you think there are enough, there's enough conversation about that right now to, to make sure that uh, the, the discussions around this uh, get it right? Um, <laughs> I absolutely. I mean, I think it's already happening. And I think that is the concern about the um, potential um, application of the concept of co regulation. Um, and I just wanted to distinguish, because I mean, I absolutely, the, the points raised about the potential of these regulations to give platforms additional powers that they could actually shield behind some of this regulation um, is, of course, of, of extraordinary concern. And it's coming even from countries, that, you know, the so-called democracies. And, you know, um, the, the point has been made how the, these powers have actually, or the freedom of expression has actually been, you know, abused by actually presidents of countries, etc. So I think the other side of that, and I think that is a concern, and I think, it, you know, we absolutely have to acknowledge it from the points that came in. But I think the other side is that, um, you know, in many countries, um, we already have evidence of um, disinformation law, new disinformation law, um, existing laws on the books being used um, erroneously, you know, illegitimately to um, uh, in incarcerate people or to, you know, um, uh, affect their credibility um, or to just, you know, and to uh, suppress um, oppression. So I think this is absolutely critical and I think that's why it's really important that we get this right. Um, because of the very differ differential political economies that we operate in, the different institutional um, endowments that we have in countries, the, you know, different applications of rule of law in different countries. And so we, you know, if this governance framework can be um, endorsed in some way that allows it to be used as a framework, for example, for regional organizations with Af within the African Union, um, for these countries to kind of get the you know, scale and scope that you need in order to be a, a voice in, in these discussions. Um, but Rick takes you know, account of our very varied context, but also very v different to many other parts of the world. So I think this, you know, the broad principles are there. The, the challenge is going to be in the 
the implementation, the details. I think there have been some very interesting examples already in these discussions on saying, you know, what institutions are already there? Uh, many of our um, countries, we've not even had the success of earlier forms, you know, effectiveness of earlier forms of regulation. So we're still struggling with that. When we're speaking about the global impacts of, you know, cross-jurisdictional impacts of these rulings, you know, half of the African population is not even affected by these because they're not even online. Um, so I think, it, you know, it's important when we're thinking about the, who's this and who's controlling it, um, that we actually look at a multiple, you know, multiple regulatory response that addresses issues of access, that addresses issues of, you know, protection and safety that were spoken about, and that potentially these do come together in um, regional or national or, you know, governance kind of councils of some form, um, but that's just ignore, you know, just saying resource constrained um, countries to be setting up additional regulation, resource intensive regulation. We need those operate those um, platforms to do the resource intensive part of it, and then we require audits, impact assessment, whatever they are. But even those are, you know, the, unless they do them, those are very expensive. We need the capabilities and the capacities in countries to be able to um, enforce or to um, uh, see, see what the results of those impacts are and make um, certain, you know, legislation and, and, and responses to that. So I think we, we need to look at what that um, fabric of self-regulation is so that it doesn't um, actually empower those countries. And sorry, just one last point to say, when we say, you know, self-regulation, it's not giving more, there's still the policy framework. The state still needs to set the parameters of that, but we need to ensure that the state sets those in a way that guarantee those freedoms and independence of regulation. Thank you. Thomas, I'm going to put you on the hook. Uh, what does success look like? How long is it going to take? Uh... Well, um, I think there's, there's one element that we are missing because it's not in the focus, of course, of, of UNESCO's core mandate, which is the economic side to, to platformization which, uh, based on economic rules, scaling effects, and so on, of course, leads to, has a tendency to lead to monopolies. And these have, of course, if it's combined with systemic functions that end up in oligopolies or monopolies, of course, this combination is something that we should look at together. And my country, Switzerland, is not a member of the European Union, but, of course, we're watching what they do, and you think, I think it makes sense uh, like to, to have the EU approach to look at it from a democracy and human rights point of view, but also look at it from a market point of view, because your ways to, to, to deal with these things are different if you're faced with a monopoly as a citizen, as a government, as an administration, as a company, or if you have alternatives. So that makes, that makes a huge difference. Then with regard to um, giving even more weight to the platforms, I think we also should discuss when, and I think it is absolutely necessary to discuss about roles and responsibilities of all stakeholders that are different, governments, civil society, and so on, but also within the platforms, as I said earlier. There's some things that, for instance, I would not want the platforms to have a role in. They should not be the judge that decides which content is, is lawful or not, or even which content is harmful or not. That should be up to experts that, that have the power and have the legitimacy and the accountability to take those, those decisions. Another element is also that I think is questionable to what extent should platforms have a role in educating people how to deal with platforms? I would actually rather have them pay enough taxes in all countries where they're active so that the public school system is able independently from the platforms to educate the kids, educate the parents, educate the teachers that they are media and, and, and digital literate in, in that sense so that they can indirectly or should indirectly contribute to things like education, social security, fighting corruption through paying taxes, but not pay directly because then, of course, then you depend on who gives you money, and I'm not really sure whether that is the right governance model. And finally, uh, about regulation and, and the different versions of regulation. As we are not a member of the European Union, we are not yet, or whatever, bound by the regulation that is coming, but also the platforms are not bound to follow this in Switzerland. So we were talking to some big companies because we told them, hmm, you're not forced to do it in the EU, but it would be essential for us too to get access for our academia to your data, to allow us and allow our people, we have a direct democracy, to do evidence-based policy making. We need scientific facts. Not all the big tech, uh, not all the platforms give access to, to our researchers. Some even go after researchers that try to get 
So we'll probably have to come up with a law too that obliges them also in our country that we get the evidence based uh, base that we need to do policy making. So self-regulation in, in Switzerland is normally the first step. That is the preferred option because it's the least bureaucratic. If it works most efficient, if it doesn't work, then you have to have the next steps that you can do so. so but whatever we, we discuss now, we may be at a different point in five years or three years or ten years, depending on how the actors behave, respect each other's roles and responsibilities. If they don't, the other actors have to stand up and try to be a little bit more convincing, let's say, in, in, in how to deal uh, with actors. That goes for politicians as well as for platforms and, and whatever we discussed. And one final word about the multi-stakeholder approach. I, I really. I'm very happy to see that UNESCO takes this very seriously because in the end we will only find, not only if I, I be able to understand the problems together, we'll only find the good solutions that work together and if all stakeholders agree that the, the solutions that we try to implement are actu actually reasonable, proportionate and make sense, then it's also easier for us all together to implement them together. So we are really convinced as a system that is built on giving power to the people, not ruling from top down, to include everybody in the decision shaping, in the decision making, but also in the implementation of the decision, but of course, taking into account the respective rules of the different stakeholders. Thank you. As one of many concerned parents out there, I can only applaud you on the, the, the school aspect of what you just said, like get the, the, the kids are on the front lines of this and they're the most vulnerable and, and that has to really be taken into account. Thank you. So let's go back to the audience. Um, I'd love someone to bite the bullet on Twitter. The, the, the panel didn't quite bite, but I think I heard a ripple. Somebody clap. Um, would anybody like to talk about this concept, but within the reality of what is happening at Twitter right now? They're going in one direction and our conversations are going in another. How do you reel that in? Anyone out there want to uh, discuss that? Yes, over here, please. Hello. Uh, Joanna Bryson from Heritage School again. I really appreciate your question, although I also really appreciate the answer. That was absolutely brilliant. I do very much agree that the problem is transnational regulation. But I still can't believe that America allowed this. It, it's essential infrastructure. We need to recognize these are utilities, and they cannot just be sold to private actors. We know DMs are not real privacy, but it's the best privacy available in a lot of countries. A lot of diplomatic uh, communication is not only owned by Musk, but also by other investors. The Saudis are the second largest. I mean, this is a, a, a catastrophe, and we need to get the country where, the, where these companies are domiciled, and it isn't only one country, we'll be talking to China too and maybe some more countries, right? It's an incredible leveler. We have recent uh, publications showing this. So we don't know where the next tech giant may come from. But we've got to have mechanisms and to hold these governments to, 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 uh, uh, to account for not uh, expressing their duties to recognize when something is a utility and when it needs a special obligations and when it can be sold privately. Thank you. Is there also a possible scenario whereby we have a two-tier internet where one part of it with newer models, newer new thinking uh, adheres to this, but then there's a Wild West that is ultimately uncontrollable? Do, do we actually think that there can be regulation for the entire internet, or will society eventually kind of give up a little on part of it? I, I think I saw it. Yes, a hand at the front there. <clears throat> Yeah, I, th I think this is where we, uh, this is Nicholas Brigham Adams from Goodly Labs. We're in San Francisco, also where Twitter is. Um, and I, I, I do think that uh, this is another place where we need to be thinking about bringing more players into the scene. Uh, so the players are not merely governments and platforms like Facebook and Met uh, Meta, Google. These are all publicly owned companies. And in the US, they, in the charter of the company, they have to be working towards the maximizing the, the, the profits each quarter. Um, with Twitter being owned by Elon Musk, uh, that is an interesting character, but at least it's not shareholders that um, are duty, you know, that are required to maximize profits each quarter. What we need to see though is many more players, many more smaller companies and research outfits um, that have access to the data from these big platforms and have access to APIs that allow them to offer services directly to the users. 
There are their existing technologies. I can point to my friend here uh, with the Disarm framework. We have Public Editor. There's Jay Swila in the room. These are all organizations that can provide services directly to platform users if governments will create interoperability policy that supports that. Until then, we, all we can do is ask them if we're allowed to help while they pretend that they're doing everything they can. Thank you. Over here. Thank you. I am Silvia Alfaro, the permanent representative of Peru to UNESCO. Uh, I would like to ask you um, a simple question. Um, what about the deep web? Is there anything to say about the deep web? I haven't heard the word in these two days. Thank you. That's a great question. Who wants to take that? Just jump, it's a perfectly uh, important question. If you look at the larger landscape, what we are discussing actually is the governance of a community of 8 billion people, five of them being online. But basically, as I was mentioning, the, five sta the four stages of, of communication revolutions, each time, if you think about it without belaboring, the size of the communities that were being organized from tribes to empires to nation state to what we have today have constantly increased. And if you look at history, it's basically the struggle of humanity to organize in structures that are larger and larger and larger. The struggles that the companies may have in managing their rules for three billion people, the struggles that we have for managing environments where some are in the dark web, as you mentioned, like extremely hard to access and police is trying to work in that regard, is like managing an extremely large cities with very shady districts and very uh, visible and very public spaces. I would argue that one of the challenges specifically on addressing the problems of the dark web is the limits of international cooperation between police and law enforcement in a due process mechanism according to the international rules of cooperation. If you talk to law enforcement actors, they will tell you how difficult it is to coordinate between countries to address things that are massively transnational. So I think it's, it's a long story and a long, whole discussion in itself, but there are different spaces in what we call the internet or cyberspace, and you're absolutely right. This is, this is a portion. The discussion here, I understand, is more about the very public square that is, that is here. But it's another illustration where the international institutional architecture is struggling. Can I just ask like 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. Super quickly, if you can. Sorry, I just wanted to go back to the very important question around essential facilities and the, also the response that these are co you know, public corporations that have to maximize profits. And I just wanted to say, I mean, I think you know, maximizing profits isn't, doesn't trump um, regulatory requirements, you know, um, competition requirements, etc. So just going back to, you know, we need to get more people who can access the APIs and do those sorts of things. Those were the things that were traditionally handled by competition regulation. And I know the antitrust stuff's kind of, you know, we've won, lost that battle, and I think we should go back to it. But these are precisely the kind of regulatory mechanisms that need to, we've got them, they're there, and they need to be put in force. And just to go to the essential facilities one, it, sorry, at, at, the, at the same time, saying, you know, we've got a history now of, um, you know, private provisioning of public goods, of, of essential facilities, that... It doesn't mean the abdication of regulation or the state just because they're privately delivered. In fact, there's greater obligation in order to regulate those in the public interest. And we now need to apply this to global digital public goods and find the mechanisms of global governance to meet those requirements so that, that we do have them kind of universally realized in, at national level, at regional level, et cetera. Got it. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm going to have to draw a line there. We're going to go back to our uh, Zoom audience uh, to see if there are any more reflections online. Thank you, Ian. So we've continued to receive comments submitted through the digital platform, 
And we just also wanted to reiterate how important it is to receive your inputs because your engagement is really what is making this a consultative process. So these inputs here focus on what participants have noticed is missing from this discussion so far. We received a contribution from an individual submission, which reads, the guidelines need a more precise definition of platforms and in particular, a size threshold. Otherwise, the category will be too inclusive of small providers and endanger free expression. The guidelines should explicitly promote a graduated and differentiated approach. For instance, the Digital Services Act has a separate category of very large platforms with 45 million users. A second contribution we received is from Abrint in Brazil, which reads, Abrint believe that multi-stakeholder engagement demands rigorous approaches that redress the asymmetry of power relationships among stakeholders and recognize the nuances of stakeholder perceptions and goals. In this sense, and in order to guarantee great results for UNESCO's framework, we must have a clear strategic communication and transparency over ideas, conflict management between stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so to wrap up, we've got about a minute left. Um, I was struck by one comment by the panel, I think it was Emma, who said that really the next wave of social needs to align both business interests with user interest. There has to be um, more crossover. Uh, it needs to be just bringing a new dimension of social media. And I certainly am coming away from this discussion with more confidence that new groups will adhere to that. But the concern is that the existing ones don't and won't because it does not adhere to their business model and ultimately they won't be making money. Um, I think there's been some very interesting conversations. It's quite daunting, I think was the word I used with uh, Thomas. Uh, there's so much to do in so little time and there seems to be little alignment with some of uh, the big platforms, but wanted to thank everyone for their input, both here on the panel, in the audience, and online, uh, and good luck to the people sorting this out. Thank you very much. <laughs>